Lord, that your word does not change. Your word is ever true. And Lord, let our lives line up with the word that you've spoken. It may offend, it may convict, Lord, but it does not condemn. Come to this world to judge it, but to set it free, Lord, through your son Jesus. And God, I just bless this time that we get to come together. We get to dive deep into this word, Lord, and that it blesses the people that are hearing it and will hear it in the future, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. So this morning I was sitting, I, I, I've been praying, and my dad asked me, he was like, hey, you want to preach? And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll preach, you know, preach several times. But I was like, God, what do you want me to talk about? And, I, and you know, a few weeks ago I had so many different messages on my heart, and then leading up this weekend it was like crickets. I was like, okay, I don't know where you want me to go. So I got up about 6.30 this morning, I, I just started praying, and Throughout the night, I kept waking up, and I was like, okay, why, why am I awake? And my brain wanted to go to several different things that had happened in the last 24 hours and wanted to fixate on those things. And I said, well, instead of fixate, I'm going to just pray. <laughs> I'm going to just pray because I can either fixate and stay up all night, or I can pray and have the peace of God and fall asleep. I like to fall asleep more than I like to, you know, worry. So this morning I got up and I started working on this message and I, I wrote down all these verses because I felt that's where God was taking me and then I started writing down my thoughts and I was like, God, I don't know how you're going to tie this all together because I was like, where I'm at and where you want me to go, two different places. I was like, but you're the master builder, so I'm going to let you do it. So I've heard all my life, all my life, that Jesus could come today, all my life. And I remember I would be going to sleep and my mom would come up and she'd say, it's a good night for the Lord to come. And as a little kid, you're just like, that's kind of scary. It's a good night for the Lord to come. And you're like, well, that means everybody's going to die. <laughs> you know what I mean? That would be my, the last thing I would hear every night. It's a good night for the Lord to come. And you're just, I fixated on that for a time is a scary thing that Jesus would come and that is the least scary thing of all that Jesus would come and he would the rapture would happen but that was something that I fixated on for a long time and I even told mama this a few weeks I've been several months ago I was like yeah you used to scare the mess out of me every night it's good night for the Lord to come but when I look over the span of my life I start realizing we're getting closer to that day. We're closer today than we were yesterday. We're closer now than when I was a kid. And if you look at the world, the writing's on the wall. And we can look at it in fear, or we can look through the lens of love and hope. We can look through where we're supposed to be going. I think about Paul. He's writing all of these letters and he says I could either do one of two things I can go be with the Lord or I can stay here and I can guide you he's like both are good options both are good options he's like it'd be real nice to get out of these shackles to go be with the Lord but I stay here for your sake I stay here for your sake so you may grow and that's where we're at in this moment. We have to be ready because when Jesus comes, it's not going to be a text message reminder, Jesus is coming back today. You're not going to get an alert on your phone. You're not going to get a neighbor knocking on the door saying, hey, did you know Jesus is coming back today? Because Jesus doesn't even know when the Father says it's time. He comes as a thief in the night. Not to rob, not to, to kill, but that's how it is. You don't know. It could be right now. It could be now. It could be now. We have to understand that that is how this is set up. And if we are not ready, then guess what? 
We ain't going to go. <laughs> and that could be scary. That can be scary until you give your, your life to God. When I gave my life to God, I was like, let's go. Anytime you want, man, let's go. Let's go. All right, right now, let's do it. Let's go. And even Amy, the other day, she's like, I'm ready for God to come. <laughs> I was like, let's do it. Let's do it. There was a, a gentleman many years ago. Uh, he was older than I when he came to this church. He was, you know, probably in his 20s. And he was like, this always a stuck with me. He's like, you know, when God comes and gets us, it'll be like, poof. It always stuck with me. He, he was a little out there, but it was it always stuck with me, just poof. <laughs> it just, it, it, in my spirit, it was funny. But I want you to think of this. You might be ready, but are the people around you ready? Have you invited enough people to, to know Jesus Christ? Have you invited enough people to have that relationship with them? Have you went that extra step or have you been silenced by fear? By, oh, well, I don't want to offend them. I don't want to offend them because guess what? The word is offensive. The word is offensive. It cuts like a two-edged sword. What is not truth, it gets cut off times when I read the word and I get offended because I'm not lining up with it and then I have to check myself well if I'm getting offended then I have to fix something but the world doesn't fix something it wants to just keep devolving in itself but when you think about it there's only so much time before the end there's only so much time before the end it might be 10 more years it might be 10 more days it might be 10 more decades before the lord comes but we have to do the part that we are called to do and that is to love people and make disciples it is to love people and make disciples it's not to judge people jesus didn't judge anyone he loved them you can quote quote scripture all day long but if you don't show people love they don't care people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care let's go to john 4 35 this morning we have people around us that we have to impact we have people that we have to impact it was funny i was i went back to the slide this morning and uh, Daddy taught on this last week, and I was like, well, look at that. Isn't God good? <laughs> you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? My question to you this morning, are you planting? Are you tending? Are you ready for a harvest? I'm not talking about money. Money's nice because it says the wages are good. The wages are good. That means everything that you need is going to be taken care of because guess what? You're serving the master. He's got everything you need. He's got healing in your body. He's got healing in your mind. He's got healing for your family. Relationships restored. But you have to be willing to do the work. It talks about in Proverbs, if you don't work, you don't eat. But if you look at this, the fields are already ripe for harvest. There have already been people planting seeds in other people's life. Are you watering it? Or are you trying to stifle it out? You could be the person today that gives that seed a little water. You can be that person. One of my friends, I did a testimonial video for them. They were struggling with conceiving a child. They spent years trying to conceive a child. And it's a beautiful message of what God can do if you trust Him. 
And God gave them a word that says, you will have a child. And it still took years from that word, that conception of that word, to when they actually conceived a child. And there was a lot of things that discouraged them. But one of the stories they were telling me, someone at work, this, this girl, she had been praying and she says, God, I feel like you don't hear me. I feel like you're not hearing me, God. Why aren't you moving fast enough? God really didn't say anything to her. And while she was at work one day, this older lady, this woman of God came up to her and said, God hears you. That seed was watered right then. Because she would have never known what this young lady had spoken, had prayed to God. That was between her and God. But he used a messenger to water the seed. Are we willing to tend the field? Now, I am not an outside person. The most outside that I did was ban. And I did it for a long time. I got a good tan. But man, any time I had to deal with a garden, I hated it. I remember picking butter beans, picking squash, all of that. My gosh, I'd rather be tied to a mule and drug behind it than tend to a garden. <laughs> I'm glad I get some amens. It is work. It is not fun. The same thing dealing with people. It is not for the faint of heart. Dealing with people that don't want to change. Dealing with people that have their own agenda, their own wishes, their own wants, on top of the confusion that sin in this world is pouring on top of them. That is what we're dealing with here. But if you don't work, you don't eat. If we're not willing to do it, then no one's going to do it. When I first got saved... When I really dedicated my life to God, there was fruit. There was fruit. There was a change. And people around me started seeing that change. And it has started affecting the people around me. My students were like, Mr. Dykes is different. There's something going on here. He's happy. <laughs> and I had already been married for about a year at that point. So... I love Amy, but it wasn't me and her being together that gave me joy. I was happy to be married to Amy, but happiness goes only so far. I had joy, and that joy was rubbing off and infecting the students around me. I was not bitter anymore. I wasn't harumph, harumph, harumph. I wasn't always complaining. I wasn't living from fear of not being enough, and I was living in the point glory that god had given me i was a son of god i was living from the joy of the lord and it was my strength instead of me trying to do everything myself taking it on myself to do all these things and i felt a ton of fear wash off of me as soon as i gave it to god stuff started washing off of me and guess what God had to get the pressure washer out to get some of that hard to get to stuff. <laughs> he, had, he had to really work on some areas of my life. And he, sometimes he still gets that pressure washer out and starts hitting me with it. And that's okay. Because I want to be more like him. John the Baptist talks about less of me and more of him. I want to be less of me and more of him. That's what it needs to be. But... Guys, if I can change, if Zach Dykes can change, anybody can. I don't care what you're into, how far you've went. Now, I didn't rob any banks. You can't prove it. <laughs> I didn't do anything like that, but God took me and made me a new person. I wasn't this disfigured thing anymore. I was a child of God. I was conformed to the world i was made new i was had a pure heart i had a renewed mind that's where i lived from because i had students questioning i heard them talking what is different about mr dykes what is so different about him they would come up to my staff members like something's changed something's changed what has happened 
It was God. <laughs> it wasn't, I didn't get on any medication. I didn't start drinking. I didn't start doing drugs or anything like that. It was God. And that was it. Because I had lived my life for many years through the lens of fear. I worried if I would be the best band director. I worried if I could provide for my family. I worried. I had anxiety. I had depression, oppression. I had all of these things, and I was toting it around. And the longer you live with that, the heavier it gets, and you start hunching over, and you start getting weaker, and it just keeps building and building because guess what? Once it's there, it's just going to keep dumping on you. That's how the enemy works. He keeps coming after you because he doesn't want you to realize who you are. Because I lived life out of fear. You can either respond in two ways, out of fear or out of love. That's the only way. That's the only way. You go read, what does Jesus talk about a lot? Fear and love. Fear and love. Bill Johnson, he's out of Bethel, great, great teacher. He's got some great messages on this. But he talks about operating out of fear and love, and he said this, fear will attract whatever information is needed to legitimize its existence. I'll say that one more time. Fear will attract whatever information is needed to legitimize its existence. That's good right there. I could literally preach just on that, <laughs> that sentence alone. Okay, so let's, let's take an experiment real quick. When I got saved, I knew that God wanted me to do certain things. Because before then, my social media presence was a lot of complaining. Okay, complaints or fears. Okay, let's just be honest with it. A lot of complaining, all of this, that, and the other. All right. If you've ever been on social media or if you've ever talked to anyone that just complains, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. That was the mentality I was under was that. But when I got saved, I was like, okay, I know that I need to be a better example everywhere I go. And that's including on social media. And I'd write up these posts and it'd be, man, it'd be fire. It'd be, whoo, you know, God is it. And then before I'd hit post, I'd get scared. I'd get scared. Well, what if somebody says something? What if somebody says, well, he's just a hypocrite. Well, who does he think he is? I remember when he did X, Y, and Z. Well, I remember he used to cuss like a sailor, blah, blah, blah. Okay? That would be the thoughts that would start hitting my mind over and over and over. And there were several times where I would just go, well, I'll post it later. Or I'd say it later. And then I would give in to fear. I operated out of fear in the moment. Instead of saying, no, someone needs a little bit of watering right now. Someone needs a seed planted in their life. I operated out of fear. And, you know, I have to, I have to ask God for forgiveness anytime that happened. Because if we don't steer our lives in that direction then we're going to be all over the road. <laughs> it talks about straight is the way and narrow is the gate. It, it's, a, it's a tight fit. It's a tight fit. But if his way is, way is straight and narrow, guess what the way of hell is? It's easy. It's open wide. Whatever you want to do, baby. Whatever you want to do, come on and do it. All right? Whatever you want to do, you can do it. That sounds like someone else does it. Sounds like the world. Whatever you want to do, it's all good. It's all good, baby. It's all good. We have to operate out of love. And, guys, love is not comfortable. Love is not comfortable. <laughs> if you've ever had a, a partner and you are, your partner is laying in your arm, okay, and your arm starts falling asleep. And it starts going blue because your partner's laid on your arm for a long time. You love them so much and you don't want to disturb that peace. 
but your arm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Your arm is, oh man, it hurts. <laughs> I can't feel it over there. You start doing, you start wiggling the fingers. Are you still there? <laughs> Are you still there? But love is uncomfortable because it challenges you to be more than you are. It challenges you. Look at Jesus. He was fully man and fully God, but guess what? He still had to walk in love. He still had to do uncomfortable things. Think about when he was in the desert being tempted. Do you think that was just like, he was just, ah, you know, this is all good. He had not had food for 40 days. He might have been God, but guess what? He was in a man's body. I'm pretty sure by the end of this message, you're going to be hungry. What you going to do? You're going to go eat. So the devil coming to tempt Jesus was uncomfortable to him because it was everything that he was meant to do on this earth. Everything he was supposed to do, he was tempted by. Okay? Now, some of you might not like sweets. Okay? I don't know anyone that doesn't like sweets, but you might not like sweets. If someone promised you a cake, Big old cake, whatever you wanted. Seven layers of chocolate cake with chocolate, all of this. Oh, I see Coach back there. He's starting to smile. <laughs> someone promised you that, and then someone came by and said, Hey, I got a cupcake. You want a cupcake? Now, you could eat that cupcake, but it is not the seven layer cake that you have been promised. Am I right? It's a counterfeit. It's not the real deal. It's not the real McCoy. Jesus was tempted because what he had been promised, the devil was tempted with counterfeits. I'll give you all the nations if you bow to me. You can cast yourself off of this roof and the angels will save you. All of these things. Prove to me that you're God. That's what he was doing. We have already been proven to be children of God. We have already been, been proven we cannot step into that fear lane and let it guide us. Because if we do, we're never going to affect the people that we're supposed to affect. We're never going to plant the seeds. Okay, I got a lot of friends. I love them to death. And this is something that, this message is as much for me as it is for you. I was hanging out with some friends yesterday. We shot a wedding for them. And I love them dearly. I don't know if they're going to heaven or not. I don't know. I don't know. I look at the fruit they bear. They're good people, but I don't see the fruit of the kingdom. Now, it's going to be real uncomfortable when I say, Hey, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? They're going to be like, Zach, you're talking crazy. But if I call them my friends, guess what? I have got to do the thing that I'm supposed to do. I've got to know that they are going to heaven. I've got to be there, and it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable. <clears throat> when you wake up in the morning, there are a lot of thoughts that try to come to your head first thing. A lot of mine is, i got to do all of these things. How am I going to do all of these things? And then there's fear that tries to jump into that. Well, you're not, are you really sure you're able to do this? Do you, do you think your job, your, your company is going to make enough money? You did it, did it, did it. I can focus on that, and that's really easy to focus on. Man, worrying is so easy to focus on. You're worshiping the problem. That's what worry is. That's what worry is. Or I can tune my station over to the right thing and focus on the love of God. It says that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. That his word does not return void. He is never changing. He is the same today, tomorrow, and then ever. That's where we got to start from. That's our every day. Paul talks about you have to renew your mind daily. Let's go to James 1.8. I'm talking about God being consistent 
I look at the world and the inconsistencies are staggering. The inconsistencies are staggering what's going on in the world from when I was born to now. Even a few months ago, it is different to what is now. What the truth, what they're saying the truth is. James 1.8 says this, Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. And this is the key part. And they are unstable in everything they do. Now, if you've ever stood on anything shaky, anything that's wobbly, you're probably not going to stay on it very long, right? Okay? I, I had this notion for a while to learn how to skateboard. I don't like to be on anything shaky or wobbly. <laughs> Every time I'd get on a, a skateboard, I'm like, nope, not for me. But I was like, I want to get on this skateboard. We, as children of God, go from glory to glory. That is a firm foundation. The world goes from inconsistencies to inconsistencies because they're lies. They're absolutely lies. I literally have this. The world consistently state something then contradicts itself now I'm going to get controversial and I don't care because it's, it's the truth alright we've seen this in every single thing every single thing that the world is involved with from declaring bacteria on Mars is life to saying that a baby in a mother's womb is not life, it's just a clump of cells. That's contradicting, am I right? That's contra- From bacteria being considered life to a baby in a womb being just considered a clump of cells and not life, that's a contradiction in my book. To denying that men are men and women are women and each are beautifully made by God Man, it gets, it gets confusing. It gets confusing out there. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. It says this, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Man. Now, I can take off my glasses and it's blurry. I wouldn't want to go drive, but I would not want to be blinded. I would not want to be blinded. It keeps going. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Man, I could preach forever on that. Satan who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those that who don't believe. <clears throat> now, I said some controversial things to some people. I told you I'm going to offend, but it is so easy to get wrapped up against this side against this side. Well, the Republicans versus the Democrats, the Democrats versus the Republicans, the this and the that. The world wants to divide because guess what it wants to do? It wants to conquer. If we're divided, we cannot stand. A divided house cannot stand. Do y'all, y'all, y'all know the words I'm talking about? Okay? If we build on a firm foundation, we are not divided. But if we build on that shaky, inconsistent foundation of sand, of changing, being wishy-washy, then we're going to fall apart. I don't care if it's the church or if it's the world. You can look at the world. There are people that say that they're this and still aren't saved. Okay, they can they can say all the points that make you feel good and sign. But if they're not saved, they're not fully of the truth. I don't care who they are. I don't care what their last name is or how big their bank account is. Okay, I don't care. Some people like 
Bill Gates, some people like Elon Musk, both of them have their own issues, all right? They're not my God. Some people are trying to make them gods. They are not God. But life is not a game of winner and losers. It's not. If we look at it that way, if we look at people as you're going to be a loser because you're of this party or your skin color doesn't match mine so I don't want anything to deal with you. No, 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 no. We're all children of God. We're all children of God. We are beautifully and wonderfully made in his image. We are created for a purpose in his kingdom. I don't care where you come from, who you are, what you've been raised in. You can know the love of God. You can know the love of God. And political affiliation, that doesn't matter either. That doesn't matter. I'm, get, I'm getting down to some stuff this morning. I hope you all ready for some corn chucking here. Every single person that has ever been conceived has been made in the image of God. Let's go to James 1.18. James 1.18 says this, He chose to give birth to us by giving us His true word, and we, out of all creation, became His prized possession. Now, I know some people are like, Zach's on abortion this morning. No, that, that's only one of the topics this morning. That's why I said, God, where are you taking me this morning? We went from fear to over here to over there. He's doing it, y'all. Hope y'all are ready. It is our responsibility and our commission to go into the what? The world. Not to go into the church. Am I right? If you're in the church, you should already be what? Saved. <laughs> Or about to get saved, right? It's to go into the world and love the people and make them disciples. I know I, I have family members, friends, coworkers. You have them as well. They're wonderful people, right? You wouldn't associate with them if you didn't like them, right? I'm going to go a step further. You got enemies, you got people that you don't like. When you look at them, you're just like, oh, man, I don't like that person. They gave me the heebie-jeebies or whatever. They stole your sandwich out of the fridge 30 years ago. They need to hear the word of God. You might be the only person that ever speaks the word of God into them, that they are loved, that they are wonderfully made, that, they are, that Jesus died on the cross for them. You might be the only person. We know the truth. We've been set free. Are we going to be stingy? I know Coach West, he talks about short arms sometimes. My dad talks about short arms being stingy going out and eating and everything. But those moments, you're doing it because you love the people around you. You are providing for them because you want to spend time with them. Right? We've only got a certain amount of time on earth. And it's about this small compared to the rest of eternity. Would you want to spend the rest of eternity with your friends, the people around you? Are you going to be stingy and fearful of them getting offended by the truth? Because you're not doing it out of judgment of them. You're doing it out of love and compassion. The devil's going to try to tell you to be fearful. Oh, they're going to get so offended because of this. It's going, to, it's going to cut sometimes. But it is so worth it because they've got to know. They've got to know. Let's go to Isaiah 5 and 20. Isaiah 5 and 20. Because I don't want any friend living like this. I don't want anyone that I know living like this. What sorrow... Man, you don't have to go to the rest of that. What sorrow. If you've ever lost someone that you've loved, you've grieved over them because they got taken too early. One of my best friends, he died really young. I grieved over him. Sorrow. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is 
is sweet and sweet is bitter. It's happening right now, guys. It's happening right now. It happened then as well. <laughs> like, it's not anything new. The devil does not have this master plan. He's already been defeated. It's just a matter of time for it to happen. But it's been so saturated of late. We have to start combating the words and the world system to what the truth of God is. Okay? It can't just be Billy Graham because guess what? Billy Graham's already been, went to the Lord. It can't just be Jesse Duplantis or Bill Johnson or David Dykes or Nana or whoever. It's got to be every single person. And I thought about this the other day. We're called to be soldiers for the Lord. If we were supposed to be soldiers, that means we have to do what? Fight. You have to fight. You have to go and fight. And it's not people. It's not people. I'm about to read about that. Let's go to Ephesians 6, 11 and 12. Because so many times we've made it about others. We've made it about the person because I don't like person or I don't like the things that they're about. But Ephesians 6, 11 and 12 says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, not fighting against people, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Put on all of our God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. Your war is not against Jason. Your war is not against Susie Q. Your war is not against Joan. Whatever name, insert here, your war is not against them. They might be acting so despicable. They might have tried to steal money from you. They might have tried to steal a promotion from you. I don't care. I've had it happen to me. Someone tried to come against me, and I was not of God at that point. And oh man, I wanted to smite that person. I wanted to cut him down. I wanted to mow him over in the parking lot of a school. I wanted to slap him every time I saw him in the hallway. I didn't like him. I didn't like him. And then I got saved. I told, I told you about the power, pressure washing. Man, God got on me like, why price about that? And he said, you got to start praying for him. And I was like, nope, not doing it. And then <laughs> he started saying, oh, well, read these verses. And where it says, if you don't forgive someone, I won't forgive you. And I was like, you're playing dirty, God. <laughs> And he wasn't playing dirty. He didn't want my soul compromised because of unforgiveness and bitterness. So I started praying for that guy. I started praying for him every day. And man, it was just like, God bless him to start with. <laughs> it was just like, God, I have nothing good to say about him, but God bless him. And as it went, it got easier and easier. I started praying over him that his, his job would be secure, that he would be financially secure, that his family would be secure, that his kids would always be healthy. The people that try to curse you the most, you pray the most for. That's how it's supposed to be. Because if we're not willing to love, it says they will know you by the way you love. And it's easy to love the people you agree with. It's like, they're not going to judge that. That's not love. That's easy. It's going to be the way you treat your enemies. It's the way you treat your enemies. Let's go to Luke 5.29. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you've got to accept them and sin. Okay? You're going to be diametrically opposed to a lot of people. Because they have allowed confusion, they've allowed a lot of things to corrupt them, okay, the spirits that are around them. I am not saying, you say, you're good in every single way. Nope. If it doesn't line up with the word, guess what? It's not the truth. But you love them. That's why we're talking about this. Luke 5, 29, 32. Later, 
Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as his guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Just having a good old time. Not doing anything wrong. When you get that old religious people, the Pharisees. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Could you imagine when you're in the world and some holy roller roll up, got that beehive about six feet tall, and look down on you and call you scum? Or someone with a button up, whatever, it doesn't matter. They got a Bible in their hand, they're thumping it and holler on the street, and they call you scum. <coughs> you wouldn't want to be part of them, would you? No. That's not love. That's condemnation. But oh Jesus, our example answered them says, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Mm. healthy people don't need a doctor sick people do I come to call the call not those who think they are righteous there's a lot in the church that have thought that they are righteous but their righteousness is a filthy rags but those who know they are sinners and need to repent again our war is not against people it's about the spirits that are around them. And if you don't believe in spiritual warfare, I'm sorry. You're being misled. Okay? You might think it's mumbo jumbo. You might think, oh, that's not the truth. Oh, <laughs> open your eyes, my friends, because it's real. It's real. But it isn't something to be scared of. I'm, I'm going to get back to this real quick. I know I'm a little bit over my time, but this is important. We were sleeping one night. And I woke up out of a dream, and I could hardly move. Like it, I, it was like being forced back into a dream. And there was a one bona fide demon in our bedroom, like in the corner up on the wall. And I was going back to sleep. I was like having to fight, and I started praying against this thing because I was having some really weird and bad dreams. It wasn't because I was sleepy. Because, man, it would have been way easier to go back to sleep. There are things that are trying to attack you in your sleep, try to attack you in broad daylight. I don't care when it is, there are things out there. So don't be under the illusion that there is not any spirits. Okay? Just putting that out there. But Jesus himself was having dinner with what religious people called scum. Okay? <clears throat> We can easily divide people up by how they look, how they dress, what affiliations they have, and we can easily judge people like that, okay? It's easy. It's human nature, right? I can look at somebody, they might not be dressed the best, they might not smell the best, but guess what? They're still a child of God. God still loves them. And it's easy to do that but it's not right to do it. It's not right to do it. <clears throat> I, mm, thank you, Lord. I want to go back to this point. Our war is not against them, okay? Politics, all of that, people want to say it's their fault. It's their fault. It's their fault. And it's all sides. It's all sides. You know, I love sports, but it's a the us versus them kind of mentality. It's their fault that we lost. Oh, well, it's the ref's fault that we lost. All of these things. No, we didn't play well enough. We didn't pass the ball. We didn't, you know, get enough conversions. All of these things. Are we getting enough conversions in our lives? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Now, I know there are a lot of things going on in the world right now. We had the leak from the Supreme Court. We've had the economy, inflation. Man, every time I drive by a gas station, you know what I do? Instead of complain, I say, Lord, gas prices are going to go down. Because it's easy to see that 427 go, oh, 
man, instead of that, I'm praying against it because, man, I want to complain so bad. And it's not just one person's fault. It's a whole system's fault. But there are a lot of things going on. There's confusion on mass scale about so many things, about identity, all of these things. But it seems like it's insurmountable odds against the church. There's so many things that we've got to combat against, but it starts with the individual. It starts with loving them. It starts going that extra mile to say, hey, you know you're loved, right? You know that you're loved so much, not just by me, but by our creator. By our creator. I, was, I film a local church in Pace's videos every week, and he was preaching on the great omission. I'm talking about the great commission. He's talking about the great omission. And he was giving these numbers that there are roughly about 7.1 billion people on earth. It's a lot of people. 2.2 of those people claim that they're Christians. 2.2 billion. When I first heard that, I was like, that's a pretty decent number. Like, I, that's, you know, a pretty good number. <clears throat> but when he said the next figure, I was like, it's not good enough. There are 4.9 billion people that do not say that they're Christians. And it's not because I hate certain groups of people. It's because I want them to know Jesus. Because he's changed me wholeheartedly. He's made me into a, such a better person. My last scripture, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is what we're called to do. Jesus came and told his disciples, this is after the resurrection. This is right before he ascends to heaven. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, he's given that power. He is declaring it over his people. Go, make disciples of all nations, of all peoples, of all ethnic groups, of everyone. No one is excluded here. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teach these new disciples to obey all commands I have given you and be sure of this I am with you always even to the end of the age Jesus is with us now you can look around and it's like where are you at God he's with us he's with us anytime I preach anytime I talk I I always give a challenge to myself and everybody. Examine your sphere of influence. Think about the people you come in contact with more than once a week. Now, you don't have to answer any of this. Do they really know God? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they know the Lord is their personal Lord and Savior? That if it happened right now, that they would be going to heaven. You might share coffee with them. You might see them at Panera when you go to Panera and get your free coffee. Am I right, Amy? <laughs> Do you know that they know? Because I'm going to ask these few questions. Do you want them to die and live in eternal damnation? Because if you saw your friend getting whipped right now by somebody else you'd go and stop them wouldn't you you'd stop the torture right now if it was happening in front of you why are we not doing what we are commissioned to do why are we not watering the seed why are we not doing those things and this is for me as well i am guilty on this that i have not done enough because out of fear i've lived out of fear so much of my life and i'm tired of it i want us to be free from that i want us to stop finding every excuse why to not do something. I think about my mom and dad. I'm going to close on this. I only did one. My mom and dad and my grandmother, they prayed for me all my life. Grew up in church. Heard no telling how many sermons my lord i have heard sermons from you're going to hell in a handbasket to 
Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I've heard of all hellfire brimstone and the love of Christ. <laughs> I've heard it all, as many of us have as well. That didn't mean I had a personal relationship with God. They prayed for me, and they planted seeds every day. My mom planted seeds of me. My dad planted seeds of me. I'd get text messages. It would tick me off. I'd get so mad at my mom, say, I plead the blood of Jesus over you. Guardian angels encamp about you. You're blessed going in. You're blessed going out. You're blessed to be a blessed. I didn't want to hear any of that because I was in sin. It made me uncomfortable and it made me upset. Just being honest. It took not just those people, the pastors I had been under. It also took my wife. Amy got saved. I remember this conversation. It took her and everybody else to get me to where I am. A lot of planting, a lot of watering, a lot of weeding those weeds out. It takes everybody. It takes everybody. So that is my challenge to you. You got to water, you got to weed, you got to plant, you got to till, you got to do all of those things. Because if you're not, someone's going to go to hell. And I, I'm not going to let that be on my conscience. Lord, I just thank you. Bless this word, Lord. <clears throat> let it be a challenge and a call to your people. That we don't sit idly by, that we don't let fear find every excuse, everything to let us just skate on by, Lord. Lord, that we would challenge the very foundation of this world lord that it would come in line with your word and lord that we would show the love of christ that we would love people enough to be uncomfortable to ask them do you know jesus and if you don't i want to tell you about him god just bless everyone that is under this word today everyone that will listen to this later bless them as they go throughout their week lord and show them holy spirit and embolden them that they are sons and daughters of the most high and that you will never leave them nor forsake them in your name i pray amen guys thank y'all for being here today y'all have an awesome awesome week and we'll see y'all on next sunday morning